Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we're taking a look today at the Mi Android TV Stick. This is by the same company that makes the Mi Box. It is very tiny as you can see here and is running Android 9. It's probably the smallest Android TV device I have seen yet. And we're going to do a full review of this in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor is anyone reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this little stick is all about. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, I do not know what the U.S. price point will be for this, but I expect it to come in at around $30 to $40. I acquired this before it was released here in the United States. So let's dive into the hardware now and see what this thing is all about. It is pretty simple. You've just got an HDMI plug here on the front. You plug this into the back of your TV and connect up some USB power to it and you're good to go. They do give you a power adapter in the box, but many TVs with USB ports should also be able to power this. It just needs five volts and one amp, basically a smartphone charger will power this device. Now, I got a lot of questions about this the other day on a live stream about whether or not this is better than the Mi Box, also made by Xiaomi, which is an older product. And the answer is that this is not better than the Mi Box because it's only a 1080p streamer. So this is going up against some of the low-cost Roku and Amazon devices. And what's unique about this one is that it's running Android TV 9. And if you wanted to play around with Android TV, this might be a very cost-effective way to get in there and do that. And that might be a reason to purchase it. Also, if you've got an older television that's not getting its apps updated anymore, this might be good for that as well. And of course, if you have a dumb TV that was never smart, this is a great way to make it smart. Uh, but it's no replacement for the more advanced 4K devices that are out there. Uh, the one advantage to having Android running on your device is that this doubles as a Chromecast. So for not that much more money than a Chromecast, you can get Chromecast functionality and get the full Android TV interface that I'll show you in a few minutes. And that, again, might be a reason to consider this. Now, for the hardware specs here, this is not that powerful. It only has a gigabyte of RAM, which is very little these days for a TV device. It is powered by a Cortex-A53 processor, which, as you'll see, isn't bad, actually, but it is going to be hindered a bit by its lack of RAM. And it also has 8 gigabytes of onboard storage, and it supports AC wireless networks. So if you have a recent router, you'll be able to take advantage of that improved network connectivity. It also supports Bluetooth, so you can hook up game controllers and that sort of thing. Uh, the remote is a pretty basic remote here, very similar to what you might see on other Android TV devices. It is a Bluetooth remote. You've got your uh, rented real estate here from Netflix and Prime Video. I don't believe you can customize these buttons, so these will always go to those two apps. But you can do voice searches on here just by pushing the button and asking it to look up something for you, which I will demo in a few minutes here. Again, nothing spectacular, but it is a good little remote that seems to work nicely. Uh, the device also supports HDMI CEC, so you can have it power on your TV when you hit the power button. All right, so let's take a look and see how it performs. I've got it attached to this splitter here so we can capture the footage while we're talking about it. And you'll find here that this is a run-of-the-mill Android TV interface. I've done a video about how to configure this interface if you're curious as to how to get it to uh, be customized to your liking. It's very content-centric, uh, but you can get your apps placed here on the app bar for quick access to those. One of the things that I like about Android TV is that it has a very rich game library in addition to the standard video playback stuff. And you'll spend a lot of time just poking through all the different things that are available there. A lot of the games are free, and some of them are available at a pretty low price. If you're into retro game emulation like I am, there's a lot of options for that as well. We'll check out uh, its gaming prowess in a little bit, but uh, you'll have some fun poking through all these things. You'll notice that it does feel a little sluggish compared to more expensive devices. Uh, that's due in part to the fact that this is an entry-level device and it doesn't have all that much memory and its processor is a little on the lower end side of things. But for video watching like on Netflix or Amazon Prime or YouTube, it should be fine. Uh, because it only has a gig of RAM, you'll often be loading these apps up from scratch as opposed to pulling them back out from the background. Um, but again, for basic video watching on one of your extra TVs around the house, 
it should be fine. We'll just load up Star Trek The Next Generation real quick here, and you can see how fast everything pops up, so no issues there. Now, because this is an Android TV, and because you've got the button here on the remote, it is integrated with the Google Assistant, so you can use it to turn your lights on and off if you want. You can also ask it to do things or look things up for you. Uh, so, for example, I can push the button here and ask it, what's the weather in New York City today? And it will come It'll back up with today, the weather in New York City or anywhere else that I want to know. Uh, you also have some universal search capabilities with this. So I could ask it something like, show me Star Trek The Next Generation. Unfortunately, though, the uh, Google universal search for content is not as good as what I've seen on Roku, for example. So it does show me that I can find it on Netflix and I can find it on Google Play Movies if I want to pay for it but I know it's available on Amazon Prime Video, and I have that app installed, but it's not showing me the search result, likely because Amazon and Google haven't worked out a deal as to who gets to show up on the universal search here. So it's a little limited, again, versus other platforms, but you got it there. Now, as I mentioned, it also works as a Chromecast, and I've got Netflix loaded up on my phone right here. And if I tap on the Chromecasting icon, I can go and select my Me TV stick here. And what that's going to do is summon up Netflix and I could start uh, playing this movie from my phone and have it play on the television, just like it would on one of Google's Chromecast devices. That seems to work just fine, not having any DRM issues or anything else like that going on. So that was a good experience. Uh, now, one thing that I did test earlier though was whether or not uh, the device could turn on the television if it was off and it doesn't look like it does that. I have a TV that will respond with a regular Chromecast. It'll power itself on and start playing when I initiate the Chromecast. Uh, this device would not do that. So if you're looking for something that will turn your TV on and start playing, this is probably not gonna be for you, at least not at the time I'm recording this video. Uh, there are others out there that do do that, like the Chromecast, but right now it looks as though even though this does support HDMI CEC, it's not able to turn your TV on from a Chromecast request. All right, let's take a look at some games now. I've got one running here called Hover Tank Takedown that seems to be running okay. Uh, nothing spectacular here, again, on the hardware standpoint, but it does look pretty good. It seems to be running at a decent frame rate. This is not the fastest running game out there, but it seems to be running smoothly, so that was good. And a lot of the casual games that you'll encounter on the Android App Store uh, should work fine on the device here. So no real issues there. It's working fine with my Bluetooth game controller here as well. Uh, this is not a great gaming platform. You'll probably want an NVIDIA Shield for that but it will run a good number of games that are available for you on the Google Play Store. I also tried some game emulators out. This is a Sega Genesis emulator here running without any real issues. I am recording this at 30 frames per second, so it may not look as smooth as it does on my monitor right now, but overall, uh, no issues here running with the 8 and 16-bit stuff. Let's throw something a little bit harder at it. So here we are running Retro Arch with the uh, Parallel N64 core. This seems to be doing okay, and the audio is breaking up a little bit, so I think the Nintendo 64 is going to be about the limit uh, as to what you can do with this device. But I was surprised that it ran the N64 stuff as well as it is doing. So overall, it's a pretty good little toy to play around with if you wanted to mess around with some 80s and 90s emulation. Just don't expect all that much from it. And some of you I know do a lot of in-home game streaming and this seems to be doing okay at that. Uh, we're running Steam Link right now and I am streaming this from my gaming laptop which is connected via Ethernet. Uh, now, we have the Mi Stick here connected via AC Wi-Fi, but my access point is right above me. So you may see less than perfect conditions in your own environment if you have this thing tucked behind your television. But it does seem, under ideal circumstances here, to work pretty nicely. Uh, input lag isn't any worse than I typically experience on in-home game streaming, and the game controller here seems to be working pretty nicely. But again, your mileage will vary based on the quality of your Wi-Fi connection. All right, next let's take a look at live TV watching. And as many of you know, I use an HD home run tuner to do that in my house. These tuner boxes bring in over the air content from an antenna and push that digital content out over your local network. And then you can use devices like the stick here to tune into those local broadcasts. Now, typically these broadcasts are difficult to do over Wi-Fi because these are MPEG-2 files. 
They tend to be really finicky when you've got a lousy networking connection. And I often recommend that you only use Ethernet to do live TV from an over-the-air tuner. But here, under ideal Wi-Fi conditions, it seems to be doing okay. Uh, this is a 1080i broadcast from my local CBS affiliate. It is properly deinterlacing it, which is good to see on a low-cost device, and it seems to be doing okay. Performance, of course, is a little sluggish, as everything is on this box, so it's not going to be ideal all the time. Channel switching will be a little slower than it might be on an NVIDIA Shield, but it does seem to be doing okay. I have the cable television version of this box called the HD Home Run Prime, uh, but again, it's pulling in content exactly the same way it would on an over-the-air box that Silicon Dust manufactures. And in full disclosure, they are an occasional sponsor here on the channel. Now, also of note, this works with the Live Channels app, which is part of Android TV. Uh, this is compatible with the HD Home Run, but also other tuners too. And as you can see, it is pulling that in just fine. Again, the 1080i is coming over nicely. And then you've got a more traditional channel guide here versus the HD Home Run app if you prefer that. Again, this is baked right into Android and all is good on the live TV side. But again, just be very careful about your Wi-Fi connection because if it is getting a weak signal behind your TV, your performance will not be as good as what you just saw here. All right, one last thing to check out, and that is Plex and home theater performance. Now, of course, my expectations for this device were quite low, given that it is an entry-level streamer, and my expectations were met accordingly. This is not good for home theater for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, of course, is that it connects over Wi-Fi only. So if you are trying to play back Blu-ray MKVs, you're going to be met with a lot of spinning dials here as things get... Uh, buffered up. Uh, not a good experience and I found the video while it would sometimes work okay other times would get jumpy and buffery if that's a word as the Wi-Fi connection was getting saturated so not good on that front. Also not good is that it doesn't support uh, the audio pass-through over HDMI so I can't get my lossless audio formats out to my home theater receiver and it did not automatically switch into 24p mode on movies that are at 24p. So those are the things that I want a home theater device to do. This one doesn't do any of those things, although you could probably coax it to play back some Blu-ray MKVs if your Wi-Fi connection was stable enough. Uh, that said, if you've got transcoded media like TV shows and other things, that will work fine. Uh, but the big stuff, the high uh, velocity, high bitrate files, aren't going to work very well on here. And even if you do get them playing back, you're not going to get the full home theater experience. But again, I'm not expecting that out of a entry-level stick device. And in full disclosure, Plex is also an occasional sponsor here on the channel. But all things considered, I am pretty happy with what they've put together here. It is nice to see a low-cost Android TV stick out there for secondary televisions. We've often seen a lot of the generic stuff from China you know, coming in and around what I think this one will land at here in the U.S., but you didn't have the official Android TV. There was always issues with them. Uh, this one's legit Android TV on a stick and a nice alternative to maybe the Roku stick or the Amazon Fire stick. If you want real Android, you can get it here, and I think that's its uh, main selling point. Uh, live TV worked well. Netflix and YouTube were all fine. Not for home theater, you're not going to get all your fancy HDR and Dolby Atmos and everything out of this, but for, again, a secondary television, this is a good option, and I'm looking forward to seeing this hopefully in the U.S. market at some point in the near future. Maybe it's already there by the time you're watching this video. That's going to do it for now. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, this is Lon Seibin. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.